Hi, it's me, Franklin, and here I am near some pillars. Last week, we learned about threads. The week before that, we learned about processes. One of the cool things that we learned about threads, and possibly also one of the frustrating things that we learned about threads, is that threads can communicate with each other. Threads have the ability to communicate with each other basically by just reading and writing memory. We really quickly discovered that, that that's great, it's super good that threads can communicate with each other, but the issue with it comes down to these data races and critical sections, where we've got concurrent threads of execution that may be trying to read and write memory in the same location within the same process. And that also then means that they are trying to read and write memory within the same virtual address space, within the same virtual memory. If you think all the way back to two weeks ago when we learned about creating processes, one thing that you might be thinking after that is, well, if threads can communicate with each other, what about processes? How can we get these coarse-grained concurrency mechanisms, processes, to interact with one another and to communicate with each other? There's one way to do that that we have sort of seen already. You may not really have thought about it, but it's possible to do it. And that is, just before you fork your next process, you change values in memory. When you do the fork, that process's state as it was at that time is cloned, including the virtual address space and including the virtual memory for that process. You can make this one-time communication between processes where there's this direct parent-child relationship between them. But that doesn't really represent the, the truth. That doesn't really represent all kinds of processes that are in a system. Not every process comes directly from some other process. Sometimes we want to have processes in a system communicating with each other in ways where we don't have to know about their relationship to each other. This week we're going to be looking at inter-process communication. So different kinds of mechanisms and methods that we can use for having processes interacting with each other and communicating with each other. So we want to talk about threads. No, we want to talk about processes. So we want to talk about processes. Processes do not share this virtual address space. We've got two processes in a system. They effectively see memory as though it were entirely their own. Processes can't really interact with each other by writing in one another's memory. That's just not something that can really happen. There are some things that processes do share though. So one thing that they can share is their heritage. They can share a relationship in that, that parent-child sort of relationship. Another thing that they can share is an operating system you might say to yourself, well, that's pretty obvious, and I, I guess that's true, but it's worth saying that there is this third-party thing that exists in a system that is aware of all of the processes in that system, and there's this third-party thing in that system that can help those processes within that system communicate with each other. And a final thing that processes share when they're on the same system is a file system. When we think about processes, we're limiting ourselves to this idea of virtual memory in terms of RAM, in terms of memory that's installed on a system. But there's this layer that's lower in the hierarchy of kinds of memory that's available in a system. Our file system is something that's shared by all processes on a system. And that's kind of important because it means that all processes on a system can indirectly communicate with each other through files. You've got a text editor, you've got a compiler. While these two processes may not necessarily be running at the same time, sometimes they actually are. You've got your text editor open and you've got your compiler running and compiling your code. Those processes are, in effect, communicating with each other through the file that is your source code. 
your text editor has it open, your compiler reads that same file and then emits some binary code that represents what your instructions are supposed to be. We're gonna look at three different mechanisms of inter-process communication. Two of them are effectively going to be using files, although not, although not in the same way that your, your text editor and your compiler are using them. And the other is not really gonna use files at all. It's gonna be a way for our processes to communicate through an API. So let's start with that one. The first way that we're going to talk about inter-process communication is the most primitive way of talking about inter-process communication. That is signals. Signals are the most primitive kind of inter-process communication that you can have on an operating system. The only thing that we can send with a signal is an event has happened. We can tell a process what kind of event has happened in that we have some limited set of signals that we can send, but all we can say is an event has happened. Our processes then can do something based upon that event happening. We can register signal handlers, which are basically going to be functions that get invoked when an event happens. The only information that that signal handler is going to have is that an event happened. Signals are primitive, and I want you really to think about this in terms of the kinds of signals that like boats have. So maybe you've thought of this before in, the, in, in I don't know, I don't know why you would have thought of this before, but maybe you've thought of this before. Boats, boats can communicate with each other with flags, literally flags. The flags that these boats use to communicate with each other are signals. They indicate that events have happened or they indicate that a boat needs something. There's no other information that can be shared with those flags because it's literally just like raising a flag up in the air and showing it so that somebody far away can see that flag, that color, the pattern, the shape, and so on. We can actually send signals to processes that are running on our system right now with, without even writing any code, which is kind of cool. We can do this without doing any coding at all. One way that we can do this is using something called the kill command. Let's take a look at the manual page for the kill command. So kill is the name of this command and the kill command is described as terminate a process. That's actually a bad description for this command. The kill command actually has the ability to send signals to processes. That's what the kill command can do. In the synopsis here, what we see is that when we run this kill command, we can pass different options to it. And the most important option that we can pass to the kill command is this dash S which is the type of signal that we want to pass. When we run the kill command, we actually also have to say who we want to send it to. And that's this PID, the process ID. So think back to processes, think back to fork, think back to that API. When you fork a process, what the parent gets is the process ID for the child. So that's, some, that's that value that's stored in the process control block that uniquely identifies that running process. This kill command lets us send these signals to specific processes by ID. If we can send these signals to other processes, but what are the other processes supposed to do with those signals when they receive them? We, have to, we actually have to write code to do this. We have to write code to handle signals. Let's now take a look at the manual page for the signal system call. So kill is the name of this program, and it's also coincidentally the name of a system call to send signals to processes. Signal is the name of the system call that we're going to use to register a signal handler. This first of all describes the signature of this function. It's going to return this signal handler type that's been typed up just before the signature for signal. The signal function, the first argument is the signal number that you're interested in actually handling, the one that you're interested in listening to, and then an, a function pointer. This is the code that you want to be run 
when this signal is received by your process. The first line of the description of this code says, avoid its use and use SIG action instead. This is not wrong. It's not wrong, but we're going to ignore it for the sake of this course. The signal API is simpler to use than the SIG action API. So we're just gonna stick with that. What this describes is if the signal signum is delivered to a process, so this code gets executed, you write this in your own code, you register this signal handler, which is going to be a pointer to a function, and that's the function that you want to be executed. It says if the signal signum is delivered to the process, then one of the following happens. The first thing is if the disposition is set to sig ignore, then the signal is ignored. In a lot of cases, this is actually the default action that a signal handler has for a process. Processes, all running processes when they start, have default actions that can happen for a signal when it's received. A lot of the defaults are to ignore the signal, just don't do anything. The more interesting one is, the third one here, if the disposition is set to a function, then the first, then first either the disposition is set to, to reset to sig default, which is actually not true anymore, or the signal is blocked and then the handler is called with the arguments that are passed to it, with the argument that is uh, the signal number. That is basically the action that happens when you have registered a signal handler for a specific signal. This is informative, it tells us how to get this stuff running, but it's not super useful in terms of one, visualizing how this works, and two, seeing how it actually should be written. So let's take a look at some code. This is a simple piece of code that shows how a signal handler is registered within a process. So lines one to five at the top, this is just some standard includes. Lines seven to 10, are going to be the handler itself. This is a regular function. It's a void type return type with an integer argument. So this is the signature of the function that's, that's type deft in the man page for signal. And all this does is print something and then return. In lines 13 through 30, we've got the main function. We're gonna ignore lines 15 through 19. All, all those lines do is set up some kind of like fancy display stuff. And I'll show you this later, but we'll just ignore it for now. The really interesting line here is line 21. This is the first actual statement that would be executing code in this function. It says, I want to register a signal handler for the sig interrupt, for the interrupt signal. Signal sig int, so all uppercase, this is a number ultimately, and then the handle, so the function pointer that you want to be invoked when you receive this signal. After that, lines 23 through 27 is just this process running forever. So it's just running and sleeping and running and sleeping forever in a, in a, in a loop, an infinite loop. This is great. This shows us how this API is used, but it doesn't really show us what happens when we run this code. So. Let's get an idea of what this code looks like. Let's try running this. I've got three panels open here. On the left side, it's the code that I just showed you. And on the right side, I've got a split. On the top, I'm going to compile and run code. And on the bottom, this is where I'm going to figure out where my process ID is. I'm actually gonna change the code, I think, to use get pid. And then I'm going to, this is where I'm going to send signals with the kill command. So I'll compile and I'll run this code. I want to send signals to this code. I'm going to need to use this kill command. I want to send signals to a running process. So I need to know what its process ID is. I've printed out the process ID but you can also use that PS trick that I had showed you before in class to find out what the ID of a running process is. So this is way back to when we were using cat, just to show how processes are run on a system. I'm also gonna do this PS thing a little bit differently than before. 
I'm going to use a pipe. We're gonna talk about pipes a little bit later, but I wanna pipe the output of the ps command into the standard input of another command called grep. Grep is a program that will filter lines. It will do pattern matching on lines, and if the line matches, it will print it out. If the line that it reads does not match that pattern, it will not print it out. It's a, it's a straightforward program, and it's really handy to use. So I'm going to run this ps command. I'm going to pipe the output through grep. And what I'm going to see is that the process ID is right here. At this point, I'm going to use the kill command to send signals to my process. I'm going to pass sig int to this process. I'm going to send this sig interrupt signal to my process just to see what happens. That's pretty cool, but it's also extremely limited. I can't really do much beyond, hey, this event has happened. I don't know who sent it in the process that's running. I don't know anything else about what's happened. I just know that I've received this signal. This means that when you send signals and when you receive signals, they kind of have to be well-defined what you should be doing when you receive that signal. And it should be well-defined in advance why a process is sending that signal to you. Signals are great, but they're kind of limited. A slightly better thing than signals for inter-process communication, a ah, significantly better thing than signals for inter-process communication is pipes. A pipe is a way to open a channel of communication between processes. The main benefit with pipes is that they're going to allow us to send more than just an event has happened. They're going to give us the ability to actually send real messages between processes. We're going to talk about a system call. We're going to talk about how it works. But I actually just want to get started with the general idea of pipes. So I want you to think way, way back. I want you to think all the way to Comp 2160. No, wait. I actually want you to think all the way back to Comp 1020. Actually, I want you to think all the way back to Comp 1010 and Comp 1012. In those courses, you learned about this magical print function. When you thought about that magical print function when you used it, what you did was you passed it a string and then something showed up on the screen. It was magical. It was amazing. Eventually you heard about this word standard output. At, at some point you've heard about it, even if it was just five seconds ago. In addition to standard output, there's this idea of standard input. Standard input is going to be where we get input from, very generally. For what, for what we're doing right now, what I care about is a process has a standard output and a process has a standard input. That's what I care about right now. Standard output is where printing goes to, Standard input is where input comes from, so someplace like a keyboard. These are streams, very generally and abstractly, these are streams that we can read from and write to. So literally using the read and write system call. Printf, for example, is a wrapper around, it's a, it's a C library function that ultimately calls the write system call. Scanf and getS and fgetS these are functions provided by the C library that ultimately invoke the read system call, which you're now familiar with. A pipe can connect these streams together between processes. Here, I've got two processes, process A and process B. The output for process A has been redirected to be the input for process B. I've connected these two processes together with this pipe idea. The standard output that comes from process A is going to be used as the input for process B, so the process B's standard input. We don't always want to use standard input and standard output for connecting processes between each other. That would be inconvenient because we still might want to actually print stuff out to the screen. So instead, we're going to use this pipe system call to create new streams between processes. We're going to look at this pipe system call. We're interested in 
the pipe system call, not the pipe two system call. It's there, it's good that you know about it, but we're really just interested in the pipe system call. The pipe system call returns an int, so that's going to be the status, whether it succeeded or failed, and it takes as input an argument that is an array of integers of size two. These integers are file descriptors. In the same way that that open function returns a file descriptor to you, the pipe function actually creates two new file descriptors that can be used in a program or in, in a process. The pipe system call in its description here says, creates a pipe, a unidirectional data channel that can be used for inter-process communication. This is a one-way channel of communication. A pipe is going to be between two processes and it will be exactly one way. One of the processes can write to it and one can read from it. In this example that we just saw, process A is writing to that stream, process B is reading from that stream. It's a one-way channel for communication. Let's take a little bit of a look at some code here. On line seven, this is the first thing that's interesting. We're declaring this array of integers with two elements in it. It's called FD because this is going to be an array of file descriptors. On line eight, we have this PID T PID. PID T is another type that you can use to represent a process ID. It's ultimately an integer value, but it's a nice way to say, hey, this is a process ID and it should be treated as a process ID. On line 11 is where we actually call this pipe system call. The pipe system call, what we're passing to it, is that array of two integers. Notice that between lines 7 and 11, we do not populate that array. That is because when we pass this to the pipe system call, the pipe system call is populating this array. After that, we call fork. Pipe and fork are going to be the way that a parent and a child process can communicate with each other. The fork system call then does what we expect it to. It will cause this process to create a new process. And then after that, we've got a parent and child relationship. We've got this branch that happens below it. The parent process now closes one half of the file descriptors and then the child closes the other half of the file descriptors. The parent writes to file descriptor one, the opposite of the one that it closed, and the child reads from the file descriptor zero, the opposite of the one that it closed. The only thing that these two processes are doing right now is sending this message, hello world, that's it. There's nothing crazy going on here. Line 17, parent writes hello world to that file descriptor one, it's writing to the right end of the pipe. On line 20, the child is reading from the pipe and it reads hello world into the buffer that is line. And then it just writes it out. This is great. This is better than signals because it's letting us send information between processes. We're no longer limited to just having an event has happened and you should do something. We're actually able to send information between processes. This pattern that we're seeing here pipe and then fork and then write and read closing one half and reading from one half or writing from one half the common pattern for this is that we want to create a new process and we want to write and then exec something and then we want to write to standard input for that process or read from standard output for that process into our own program there are two convenience functions that are provided by standard libraries called p open and p close the p open function will create a new process, it will fork it. In the parent process, depending on what you pass as the second argument to popen, it will either close the read end or the write end, and it will allow you to either read the standard output of the process that gets forked and then exec, or it will allow you to write to the standard input of the process that gets forked and then exec. These are provided by our standard library. These two are not system calls. They are not system calls. They're not handled by the operating system itself. We're gonna look at a simple example here, which is a, a filter program. So here's a diagram. The parent process is going to create this filter program. It's gonna fork it, 
And what it's going to do is it's going to read the standard output from that filter program. The standard input of what you type in as the user is going to be directed to the standard input for that filter program. The filter program writes to standard output, which is directed to the parent process. The parent process is going to print to standard output a prompt that you see. Here's some more code. This is the child process. This is what's going to be run in the child process. All this does is get char. So on line nine, it gets a single character of input. On line 10, it tests to see is this an uppercase character or not. And if it is an uppercase character, it converts it to a lowercase character. And then on line 12, it prints it out. That's it. That's all this does. Read one character at a time, test to see if it's uppercase, and if it is uppercase, convert it to lowercase. When we compile this program, we're gonna compile it as a program called my UCLC, my uppercase lowercase. In the parent process code, we're going to use this popen convenience function. So on line 10 here, we're saying popen my UCLC, and we're opening it for read. With the popen function, what we're saying here is, I want you to pipe, I want you to fork, I want you to exec this program that is called my UCLC, and I want you to set it up so that I can read from the standard output of that program. That's what this line is basically saying. There's this infinite loop that's happening with a for loop, and what it does is just read constantly from that file pointer. This again is a, a library function that's provided to us, which gives us this nice ability to use things like file pointers instead of file handles. We're constantly reading from that pipe and then just writing out. So F gets from the pipe and then F puts to write out to standard output. At the end of this, once the loop has pro finished, then we P close this file pointer that we have. This is different from F close. And I invite you to think about this for a second. Why might we have to do this differently than just using F close when we, when we got this file pointer from P open in the first place? Pipes in general are really good because they let us send more information between processes than signals. We are no longer limited to just this event has happened, but now we can actually say, hey, you should take this message and do something with it. The problem with pipes is that they're limited to a parent-child relationship. A, an anonymous pipe, what we're getting back from this pipe system call, is limited to a parent process that creates this pipe before it forks off a child process. This is limited. Sometimes we want to have processes talking to each other that don't have this parent-child relationship. So we're going to talk about something new called a named pipe. A named pipe is also called a FIFO. A named pipe is created using this system called make FIFO. In the manual page for make FIFO, there's two variations of this function or this system call, but we're only interested in the first one, so the make FIFO system call. It takes two arguments. The first is a path, a, an absolute path to a file or a path to a file. The second is a mode that the file should be created as. The make FIFO system call will actually create a file with a name, or at least it creates a thing that looks like a file with a name on the file system. Think back to what we talked about with processes. They can't interact with each other's memory, but they do share a common file system. This named file that this make FIFO system call makes is a little bit different than your source code in terms of the relationship between your text editor and your compiler but it's something that resembles a file. That means that processes can interact with each other by opening and reading and writing to this thing that looks like a file. This is different than just using a file for communication. One is that it, it doesn't actually take any space on the file system. So this thing that we create that looks like a file with the make FIFO command it looks like a file, but it doesn't actually occupy any space in the file system. Another major difference between files on the file system and this thing that looks like a file that make FIFO system call gives us is that multiple different processes can write to this thing. Multiple different processes can, in theory, read from this thing. 
That's not really true with regular files. We can't just have a regular file with multiple writers and multiple readers. What the system calls that we're looking at, open, read, write, and else seek, we can move around in a file anywhere we want. What would happen if we had multiple processes trying to write to a file and just randomly moving around within that file and writing to it? What would happen if we have multiple processes trying to read that same file while those other processors are writing to random locations in it? It's really hard to predict and it's not something that's going to be permitted in some cases by the operating system. You open a file for writing and the operating system might open it exclusively for you to do writing. In terms of a FIFO, a FIFO is a queue, first in, first out. You can have multiple writers and what, what happens is a write system call is going to put something into the queue. First in and then first out. It will be read from in the same order that it's inserted into that queue. There is no concept of moving around randomly in this thing that's called a FIFO. So we can't necessarily use that LSEQ system call on this thing. This is often used in a client server architecture. So here at the top, we've got this server and at the bottom, we've got multiple different clients. In the middle here, we've got a well-known FIFO. The clients are going to interact with the server by writing requests to this well-known FIFO. So this will have been created at some point by either the processes or by using a make FIFO command, which lets you create FIFOs using the make FIFO system call. They will all know about this file that exists, this file-like thing. The clients will write to it and the server will read from it. When the server wants to communicate back to the clients, the clients are going to have to have their own specific FIFOs so that they know that the messages are for them. In this case, we have one server. It doesn't care who it's for because all requests are for it. In terms of clients trying to read from something, they have to know that it, the message is specifically for them. Why do any of this? It seems really complicated. Threads within a single process gave us this ability to just read and write memory and that would be good enough. They could send messages to each other. One problem with that approach that we've really quickly figured out is that we've got this issue with critical sections, data races. Multiple threads can interfere with each other within the virtual memory of a single process. But the other reason that we might want to do this beyond trying to help ourselves get away from that problem is for design purposes. One of those design purposes or two of those design purposes is for modularity and scalability. Taking a single monolithic process and breaking it down into many smaller processes where each of them is responsible for doing one thing is a possibly better design than just having one big thing that does everything. This idea is the Unix philosophy. This idea is functional decomposition of code. In terms of scalability, it's easier to take this multi-process architecture and distribute that across machines. We're not gonna talk about that in this course, but if and when you take Comp3010 distributed computing, that's basically the idea that you have. We've got multiple processes that are trying to communicate with each other, but the difference between operating systems and pipes and distributed computing is that the communication mechanism changes. In distributed computing, where we've got processes running on different computers, physically different machines, the method by which they communicate is over the network. Here, we're using the kernel, we're using the operating system to help facilitate this communication, or file-like things, which is using the kernel and the operating system. The other reason is for safety and security. Safety, if you have multiple processes, multiple clients, one of those clients crashes for some reason, it doesn't take down the whole system. If you have one monolithic process that's doing everything, a crash in that monolithic process is probably going to take down the entire system. In terms of security, if there's a malicious actor on your system and they are able to gain control of a process that's running, 
in theory, they're not going to be able to get access to the memory of another process and interfere with that other process. And that kind of makes sense. Processes can't interfere with each other's memory as far as we're concerned. So getting access to one doesn't guarantee access to the others. In class this week, we're going to spend some time looking at how the Linux operating system implements these things. Signals, pipes, anonymous pipes, and FIFOs, named pipes. That's it for interprocess communication. Thanks for listening, and I'll, I'll see you soon.